As Marconi said, I'm Jimmy George. Um, in Portugal, you can call me Jaime Jorge, uh, but it's a more PR name here, pronunciation. Uh, I've been a Scala lover for, for four years, so I, I co-founded Codacy. My co-founder is back in Europe. Um, and all my master thesis and all the company's code is written in Scala. So we have a deep appreciation for Scala and Scala community, and so we'd like to be involved whenever we can. And so we, we had the opportunity to be here, and so we couldn't say no. So thank you for, uh, for having me and, and, and Codacy. So this is essentially what we're going to talk uh, about today. We're going to talk about uh, Scala code style. Um, and the first thing that I want to motivate you is why. Why do we care about code style? So, you know, if we miss code style, no one certainly dies. It's not a bug. Sometimes it's correlated to bugs, but it's not, you know, no one's going to get the death penalty because they missed the code style. So, um, why do we care? So, the first point is that we're reviewing code every day. So, um, some studies found and some companies are spending more than 20%, up to 50% of their time as developers reviewing code. And so it makes a lot of sense for us to optimize this process as much as we can. And so code style is one of those, those things that uh, just makes sense that we start taking care of, start having a clean code style and, 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 and adhere to rules, um, so especially because studies found that at least 20% or some, at least you know, roughly 20% of the time that we spend reviewing code is about code style. Um, one thing that is really important is that um, we found that, uh, and this has been said, actually it was, was said to me yesterday, and I found it extremely profound, um, code is written once, but it gets read and modified many, many times. Um, and I think this is extremely true, right? So we, we write code or the orders of, of a file, of a, of a module or, or a method, um, they write, write something, but then the, the effort is on, on the readers and actually people maintaining that code. And so code style is for the, the future, is for the people after us, right? Um, and also as, as team leaders or even as, as project um, leaders, our objective is to reduce the number of moving parts in our project to a minimum so that the only thing that we get to talk to our team is features and, and time to market and things like that that get our bosses happy. So um, we, one thing that we don't want to do is have a long dis uh, and lengthy discussion and pull requests about code style and variable names and being in camel case or not. And so this is really uh, why, why code style also helps you. So also it has implications on the things like onboarding. So if we have a good code style and good um, guideline, it helps for the next generation of developers after you uh, to, you know, be onboarded uh, faster um, because they, just, they, they can just check the, the, the guidelines. Um, and finally, and this is um, you know, you know, ex extremely objective to Scala, but Scala is an expressive language. Scala has a lot of features, a lot of uh, language features that we can use. Um, but this, of course, has um, a, can be a curse as well because we can be a little bit lost in the features that we that we use internally and, and other people have to maintain. So um, it's important for us to uh, have a, a clear guidelines of our code style um, and, 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 and for Scala that is, I believe, extremely important as well. And so for us tonight, um, we're going to have uh, three fundamental questions. So the first one is, what are the con current code styles? If you're going to base your project on a, code, on a code style or start a new project with a new code style, can you base or on something already existent. Uh, the second question is, are we respecting them? So as a community, analyzing uh, open source projects, of course, but are we respecting the code styles that we set ourselves to respect? Uh, and finally, what might become best practices or standards in the very near future? And so the first question um, becomes um, just essentially a list of the code styles present today. So of course, there's official code style, Scala's co uh, code style uh, built by the community, um, originally built by Daniel, uh, who did an amazing job covering many of the things that we now respect as a whole in terms of developing Scala. Um, and then we have many others like Twitter's Effective Scala, uh, many of the projects. In, these were essentially the ones that we took into consideration for this analysis. There are others that we missed out on that we'll introduce in the future. Sorry about that. So the ones that we missed from this analysis with PayPal, Databricks, and Scala Z. Um, now advancing, 
the method to uh, analyze the, the, you know, the, the Scala code styles were first of identify categories of groups of, 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 of rules, right? Afterwards, extract all rules from the code style and match them into each category, and then start understanding what they have in common or different, or how we actually, how we build the Scala code style guidelines that we have present today. And so, these are essentially all categories that go from indentation, from naming, from types and generics, all the way to functional programming, object-oriented programming, and, and these styles that I'm going to show, I'm going to show you have the, have all these all these uh, r categories and rules associated with these categories. So in total, 127 rules, all taken from the guidelines, and this is what it looks like. Um, it's it, it, it's not really readable, but the thing is, uh, in here we have all the rules and all the groups associated, um, and let's just focus on on a few. Um, on, on, let's let's focus on on a few per slide. So the idea is, for instance, that official color style has essentially the basis of every other guideline out there. Um, this shows a little bit, and then just the smaller balls show if they're used by other code styles or not, and we can see that every single other rule is essentially imported into other guidelines. And this becomes apparent when we compare to other guidelines such as Spark. So you can see that there's very slight changes, and the changes actually are just adding other rules. Um, and just comparing, for instance, with Apache Spark, Apache Spark has a maximum line length of 100 characters and some other rules, uh, like using relative imports, uh, use, always use braces if it's except for a ternary operator behavior, and do not use infix notation if method is not an operator. So this is specific to Apache Spark. Now, if we were compared with Kafka, we also have some differences, and in character, the line length tends to be the bigger, bigger thing. Um, but now we start seeing also some recommendations like using vals when possible, use private modifier when possible for member variables, um, and so forth. Now, and then we jump to Twitter's Effective Scala. Twitter's Effective Scala becomes then uh, a screen filler, and it, it, it really is clear that they did a, a really uh, thoughtful job of filling uh, a guidelines not only with rules, also building from, from the official Scala style guide, but also recommendations and even API usage. Um, and so it adds more than 40 rules to the original style guide, introducing a collection category, and actually the, the category that I, that I described previously, the last one was because of the effective, uh, style, effective Scala style guide. Um, and you can see object-oriented features, functional style advice, and even shows preferences of APIs, of course, in Twitter's sense, is their APIs. Um, so in terms of conclusion, Everything is built from the Scala style guide, which is good. Um, that means that if we were to choose a foundation right now, that would be uh, that one for us to choose and build upon that. Um, there's 127 rules, uh, even more right now. Um, you can choose for your project. Um, and I believe there are some differences. I mean, especially in the effective Scala style guide that we can already start thinking about including in the official Scala style guide. Now, Second question for today is, are we respecting these rules? And so the way that we set ourselves to answer this is, we should analyze open source projects for violation of the official Scala style guide. If we know for a fact that every other Scala style guide um, is built upon the official one, then if we find evaluation of the official one, we'll find therefore evaluation of, of, their, of that specific one. So um, objective is to understand a little bit of percentage of compliance. And the way that we do this, uh, we actually used uh, codacy, and the idea is that we find number of evaluations per 1,000 lines of code, and then based on the, num of, of the of the size of the project, we can then estimate the percentage of compliance of that project for a style guide. And then understand the number of code style evaluations per category, per code pattern, and so forth. So we analyze the 50 of most popular Scala projects, um, and these are essentially are the breakdown of all the tools that are available. Uh, we didn't use them all. We essentially used code as it uses some of them above. Special mention to Super Safe, which is an awesome tool that uh, I would hope to integrate in Codacy one day. Um, and essentially, we used uh, some of these um, above. And so, for every single project, we ended up building uh, this, and with, of course, most focus on the code style compliance. This essentially snaps off from the product, but the idea is to take a little bit of percentage by which that project 
is uh, respecting a code style guide. And so, as a result, we found that 51% 51, um, 51 uh, compliance uh, on average. Um, and we found interesting things that I kind of expected. We found a inverse correlation between the age of project and the code uh, of, and code style compliance, which is to say that a, as old as a project gets, the older the project gets, the less compliant it gets. Um, and we also found a correlation between the number of committers and the number of violation, violations, which means that the more committers you have, the more uh, problems in terms of code style you have to manage. Um, yeah, sorry. The older the project gets, the less compliant it gets, yeah. Okay, so, so like for a particular project in time, as it's progressing, Yeah. Just in terms of breakdown, in terms of rules that we found in violations, we found a lot of formatting issues and NEMI conventions. Uh, so everything like lane, uh, curly braces, everything from uh, as, you know, defined maximum line length and so forth, method naming, object naming conventions, class naming conventions, and so forth. We found also an interesting fact. So the, the thing, and this is a few rules that we develop internally, um, there's a significant number of evaluations of, of get method applied to options. Um, now, this is, of course, as you, as you know, in your order, get method applied to option is a problem because it explodes and so it essentially fails to remove the, 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 the feature that we wanted to have, which is not deal with nulls and null-pointed exceptions. Um, and in some cases, this is, might be problematic. So we believe that this is a way that we can, um, this is something that we need to improve. And we also found a significant value, a number of evaluations of null usage. Um, this, however, I don't see it as much as a, as a problem as, because one of the reasons we analyzed a lot of libraries, and a lot of libraries tend to analyze, tend to use Java uh, code. And when you're interacting with Java, implicitly you see nulls, you know, uh, permeating your code. And so this is actually one of the limitations of the analysis. The most popular uh, projects that we, we analyze tend to be libraries, and so some of these uh, tend to not apply. Um, furthermore, it's not just because they uh, have some violations of some specific code patterns that they have bad code style. It's just that the rules that we tend to analyze these projects with may not apply. Um, and finally, it might not represent reality and is preferred perfectly. I believe it actually is 51% uh, is a very, very good estimate. I believe it's worse um, because, as we know, open source tends to have really good uh, quality uh, in the way that it's built. Um, and so in terms of conclusions, we found that uh, compliance on average is 51% to the code style that we define. Um, naming and formatting as the biggest culprits for, for these violations. Older projects have less compliance, so the older the project gets, um, the more, the, the less compliant it gets. And so in answer, uh, we, I believe that we could do a better job um, complying to the rules that we'd set for our projects. And so finally, the question, um, the final question is what might, what might become a standard? Um, but this could be even put in another in what a term, which is what might be interesting for, for us to know it and what might be added to the official Scala style guide in the, new, in the future. So we essentially, the way we collected some of these, and ma many of these you already know, but we found that on pull request comments and commit comments on GitHub, there are, some, there are many times the same comments. Um, and these uh, tend to be made by the same people um, and ten, tend to be that guy in the office that is the, the annoying guy that always is pushing the same things. Um, and so we, we essentially tried to aggregate some of these, these comments, and these are essentially the areas. So collections, testing, unit testing, object-oriented programming, and functional programming. Now, the first group, um, and I'm not trying to introduce an, a term here or nothing, but it was just an idea of collapsing containers. So whenever we use options, instead of using the get method to options, we should try to think of options as as something that I can map them. So instead of having to, to use all these ifs and try to see if they're, if they're empty or not, we can just map them uh, and use what the option, um, what the collection library uh, provides us for the options, uh, which is gets or else. So it's so, it's so much more easier, much more compact, um, and safer as well. 
Um, and this is why I, I just called collapsing containers because it's the same applies to futures. So instead of us waiting and try to collapse on demand um, a future, and we saw yesterday we should never, never block. And, and this is really the thing. Instead of getting a result, why not mapping? Um, what we see at least is that um, if you have to wait for a result, at least wait in a very specific very cornered cancerous uh, place in your code uh, when you can, in, you know, it, only there and, and only there you have the violation and then you have only one violation and violation, violations spread out to, uh, throughout your code. Um, so we also provide some, some, saw, saw some optimizations, these are actually taken from Scapegoat, uh, which is a tool that analyzes um, some, some things that you might improve in your code. Um, and these tend to be interesting because it, it facilitates a little bit the, the reading. I'm not going to th go through them all, but, um, but tend to be just some facilitation um, to read some, some collection um, methods. Now, in terms of ACA, and you, you probably already know this, but just to iterate, if you're putting vars in a message, you have global state. Um, and, and that really escapes the the purpose of you know using ACA and the idea of immutable um, state, immutable messages, and so messages have to have vars. Um, and, the, and if you have vars, and it's you need to change them quickly. Um, now we also have a, a suggestion which is state becomes too complex, context not become. Uh, and finally, do not under any circumstance expose any state to the, to the outside. So encapsulation is an important topic. Um, so, you know, classes and instances don't access each other's state internally and only communicate through messages. Um, of course, these are is already well known, but these are tend to be really uh, the topics that they get commented a lot in each uh, pull request. In terms of unit testing, and I find this interesting, um, we spend so much time developing your code um, that sometimes we treat our unit tests as like second class citizens, and so. In, in, we get implicit. We get, we, we get this implicit uh, technical debt in our tests because we just think, well, they're just tests. I don't have to deal with them, so let's just put these libraries on it. And then all of a sudden, you have to manage all these unit tests. And when you add a new feature, you start grabbing uh, your your hair. And so the idea is that, and there big companies do this. Like I'm going to show you a slide afterwards that Twitter has, or has had some some of these <laughs> issues, but. Um, consistency in test is important and making sure that everyone gets to write their unit test the same way. Um, and one way that um, is, is it's a, a, essentially could be a preferred way to write um, tests with some state is encapsulating the state in each test in a context object. And so this is actually a, a pull request a comment in, in Twitter, in, from, from a Twitter project and this comment gets posted over and over and over. Um, by this brave soul called Moses. And, and, and so this is something that might be of value for, for future reference. Now, several other, other topics from object-oriented programming, using dependency action for program modularization, traits, um, not using exceptions for commonplace errors, and using uh, encode commonplace errors explicitly using option or even uh, try. And this is essentially Scala Util. If you're using the official Scala style guide, uh, effective Scala, you'll use the, com, the Twitter Util. Now, in terms of functional programming, you should use options, of course, but not overuse it. You can also have a null object pattern if that is uh, if you're seeing yourself overusing options. Um, then not using pattern matching if you have only an if. So if you're testing for a condition, um, probably that's the only thing you need, you don't need a, uh, a pattern matching just for readability's sake. So this is again a comment that we see over and over again. Um, call by name, although it's great and, and really fancy in some situations, it can be an over, uh, overhead to, to un for understanding of future developers. And so um, we can leave them as um, delegate them to, to when we want to create new control structures such as DSLs and then prefer case classes over tuples. Um, and the main reason is that we don't want dot underscore one, dot underscore two, and dot underscore 23 all over our code. Um, final note 
for microservices. Um, one thing that might we might might have seen, and, and this slide is already a few months old, so um, it hasn't happened yet, but might, it might happen in the future, which is we might have an interaction in, when, when we think about microservices of, of declarative programming. And then when we think about, for instance, how Twitter handles uh, their microservices, they do every server as a function. So they, they combine um, every, every single operation um, as a future combinator. So the idea is that your code can look a little bit like this. So every single service is then combined with the future service and then as a result, you get um, the end service. Um, so this is just, um, it's just an interesting point. Not really, uh, not really a big, big, big trend, but something that might be interesting further along. Um, and just final, final thought, and uh, I don't want to be too preachy, but we essentially are codicy, and the idea is that we provide some of these things already aut automatically for you. Um, namely, and this is, I think, what is the most important thing, is for every commit or every pull request to give you the, the validations that you, that you have in your code, such as issues introduced, issues fixed, um, the coverage, code coverage of your unit tests, um, code complexity, code duplication, and then for every issue, we give you um, the person who did it, time to fix, documentation. This is interesting. When you're onboarding a new developer, you can refer them to this and say, just do what Codacy says you to do. Um, but even, you know, in a way to increase code quality, if you will. So this is a little bit what Codacy is. And if you're interested, you can find me in my booth. <laughs> and that's a little bit what I have for you. Thank you so much.